did you think of London when you uh, when you come here and because um, it, it went off didn't it over at the uh, Dingwalls? Yeah, Dingwalls was the first experience for everything mostly. That's when Westwood brought us out. I couldn't help it but faint at the airport. Everybody was faint. Keith, is but that your? Uh, was, is, um, that your is that your London? That's my London. Um, I have to turn it on. That's his London. <laughs> that's his London uh, tone. No, I'm Fred. We called the busy bodies, you know, me and Pritt, you know, we designed the ultra magnetic sneakers, the iconic sneakers, the first sneaker actually. I used to call Seth G's crib all the time and he wouldn't answer the phone and Miss Miller, his mom would talk and she'd give me the history on ultra magnetic. I, 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 I think Mark was quite a pest. <laughs> Mark, 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 My boy Mike took me up to Mastermind Productions and then I went up to Mastermind. Mastermind was um, a, a production with Keyboard Money Mike. Well, and that whole genre, you gotta remember the, the, the this this thing has, this culture has five elements, right? Mm. They claim four, but it's supposed to be five. I used to graffiti, mark up the city, try to be all city and things of that nature. Wow. Tack, tack, my boys, Tack Crew that I went to high school with, you know, mm -hmm. back in the days. Who, who was passing through the shop? Was there any kind of, uh, like, DJs and... A whole bunch. I mean, you had all K Capri, Doo Wop, uh, Ron G. Like, yeah. Sometimes you might get that call. Biz Markie might call me like, yo. You got that James Brown record over there? Like, you, um, <laughs> did you kind of get a little bit possessive with the break in terms of like you'd find a sample but you was kind of a little bit secretive mm -hmm. on who you would play that break to? Mm -hmm. I had SLB ones. I never used them. I never took them out the box and I, I never <laughs> bought needles from them. I just you just had, had them collecting dust. We <laughs> was more like dancing, just hanging out dancers, but we was we ran the city dancing basically. We was the top dancers. We go to the Roxy. How did you wind up dancing for the president? Different people. Larry Love just used to float on his legs and his Shaking feet. Shaking all and, over the place. Like, you know, you know, wow. his feet look like they don't touch the Sassoon. ground. Sassoon, right. Sassoon, Sassoon and you know, the glory of Vanderbilt. You know, yeah. you know Sassoon and Jordash was always on that ass. <laughs> <laughs> See, I love. Have you got? You, is that the original jacket you're wearing on stage on the tour? Because that you, you look wicked. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's same, an original. That's the same wow. jacket, brother. So, mate, can you uh, can you take me over to the uh, Buckingham Palace? I can. Uh, that'll be forty pounds. Will you give some mates discount, mates rates? Oh, no discounts. You must have um, cash, cash up front. Cash up front. <laughs> one, two, okay, mate. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. All righty. This week's show, I have three highly skillful legends in the back of the cab. And not only are they currently touring at the moment, they've dropped huge tracks like Funky, Mentally Mad, Chorus, Lion, as many other classic hip hop tunes, and I'm a huge fan. In fact, I'm such a huge fan, I've named my cab after this legendary hip hop group called the Ultra Magnetic MCs. And we've got in the back TR Love, Cool Keith, and Mark Davis in the cab. It's what an up? honor. What it's up? Good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's an honor to have you all in the uh, in the back of the ultra cab. Mm, and ultra that, taxi, that, baby. And that, how you all doing? You good? Uh, yeah, we are here, you know, getting ready to go shopping and buy some stuff around London, you know. We always been, you know, compared to the Beatles. Oh man, you are like the, Beatles the, uh, is our you are like the right hip hop now. version of the Beatles, isn't it? I yeah. mean, you're absolutely legendary. And um, I was going to say before I uh, drop you guys off to Soho because we're on, on the way to Soho now to do a few bits and pieces. Okay. Can you give um, tell me the importance of this tour and you know to your fans? I mean, you've got a huge fan base, and really your fans they're more like family. Ah, uh, yeah, we know we have a cult following you know we've just been traveling around you know touching people and letting them know that we still exist we still here you know we just tour and we like to see the people and get out and have a party not more or less a show a party which is our show is a party we like to have a party and let the people know we here at a party and give them our best and you know like you said and then on top of that we just go around the cities and look at the culture and go buy some clothes and and sit in the shop, back of a sit, sit in, in the, the back, back of, of iconic uh, London black cabs London black taxis and and you know we was here before all a lot of these groups came out here you know a lot of groups never made it to to the UK we've been out here numerous amounts of time and we just you know come out here and go back to the states like you said you know I'm the Paul McCartney of this group
And the first, um, you know, the first time you come to, into London, when was that? Was that, what, 80... Uh, 88, I mean, 89. 89 and what so what did you think of london when you uh when you come here and um because it, it went off didn't it over at the uh, ding walls yeah ding walls was the first experience for everything mostly that's when westwood brought us out so how was that i mean the fans went crazy didn't they oh yeah, yeah they were yeah. they was at the airport when we got off the plane they were waiting i was signing critical beatdown albums when i got off the plane you know they was just it was just chaos, you know. When I got in town, they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't help it but faint at the airport. Everybody was fainting. <laughs> How did that make you feel? That must have made you feel like, you know, like superstars, which you, which you are. Uh, I didn't really realize that we was that popular. I might say, popular. <laughs> I didn't realize I was that popular. Keith, is but that your? Uh, I was, is um, that your? Is that your London? That's my London. Um, I have to turn it on. That's his London. That's his London uh, tone. Um, but 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 I would say that I would. Uh, <laughs> cup of tea, <laughs> cup of tea, young man. A cup of tea. Uh, I would say when we got out here, we would uh, we would go and get out the airport, and we would walk around, and then we would uh see people and then they would say oh my god you guys are so incredible and then um we would just sign their autographs and they would just fall out all over the floor oh it's, it's, it's amazing and you, you know your music you know it touched us all as well um, oh. And I was going to say, you know, there's so many fans. I've got to give a big up to Blade, big up to oh. Prick, Prick Kelsey that sorted out this interview. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, King yeah. Prick, yeah. King yeah. Prick, Prick. King, King of the Beach, you yeah. know. My man Blade, what's good? Yeah, you yeah, know. Blade, Blade was very uh, independent. When we got out here, Blade was just the first guy with his own record company. So we got out here with Blade. We saw Blade. And then we met Blade. Blade showed us around many places in London and Blade was an independent record company within within himself. Blade, you know, is wicked, wicked channel and he's doing great things for this scene as well. But you know, King of the Beats as well, you know, Prick, Prick Kelsey, man. I mean, what, what, what a legend as well, you know, coming from where he is and bringing, you know, like underground hip hop legends like yourself, you know, like the King, <coughs> like the uh, Looking for the Perfect Beat documentary. I mean, how good is that? Ah, mm -hmm. yeah, he's an incredible guy. And you know, me and Prick, we called the Busy Bodies. You know, me and Prick, you know, we designed the Ultra Magnetic Sneaker. It's an iconic sneaker. It's the first sneaker actually to have an album cover on the box. You never saw that before. So you see any new ones doing that, you just know where they got the idea from. Me and Pritt did it first, and we did a deal with Ewing, and you know, then we did the Common Joint, but you know, the Ultra Magnetic is the first, you know, critical beat down, you know. So it's one of those uh, things that just another notch under the Ultra Magnetic catalog that's iconic, you know. Yeah, and those those boots are absolutely uh, amazing. I haven't seen the common ones yet, but uh, I'm going to have to check them out. So, Mark, how did you get in, you know get involved with the ultras? I mean, what what happened? You know, there? It's, a weird, you it's a weird story. You know, back in the day, I was you know I was so advanced listening to hip hop in Chicago. A lot of people they were late, and I got I discovered Ultra Magnetic, and I was like, these are the best guys. You know, the best rap group. You know. Everyone was talking about Kane and you know all that stuff, Rakim and all them. I thought they were great too, but I I don't think they could touch Ultra Magnetic lyrically. You know, the vocabulary and the production was just on another level. And the break, the breaks, uh, you know, the breaks you guys were using as well. Yeah, were like, all wow. the, the ultimate break beats. You know, then finding out Trav was involved with you know break beat Lenny, break beat Lou. You know that whole story. And uh, I got so cool with the group. That you know, I, I I got I used to call Seth G's crib all the time, and he wouldn't answer the phone. And Miss Miller, his mom would talk, and she give me the history on Ultra Magnetic. I I, I, I think Mark was quite a pest. <laughs> Mark, 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 Mark was quite a pest, but he he realized that the group had so much potential. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, Keith, how did uh, you come up with the the, the name of the, uh, the the group, the Ultra? Because uh, but you started in, was it 1984? In 1984, um, wow. uh, uh, you know, well, I was, um, I went to school, me and Seth went to school together. Um, we went, I went to Clinton. And I went to the rival school across from him. Oh, really? Yeah. And so what did you, you went uh, to Walton? I went to Columbus. Columbus? Oh, no, so I went to Clinton and, uh, Seth was on the basketball team, basically, uh, 
But I used to hang out with all the basketball players in the, on the high school. I used to snap and make them laugh. I was a, a joking person all the time. So um, what happened was uh, me as a joker, I used to snap all over New York, tell jokes, you know, just snap on people. I was in, I used to go places to snap. I went around his block and roasted all his his friends. <laughs> his block. And it was a guy, was me and Steve Martin used to hang out together all the time. So Steve Martin was the person that, you know, collected records too. So Steve, matter of fact, had gave me Eagle Trip in them. Right. Steve Martin gave me the Melvin Bliss record to, to sample after, you know, me and Seb was using the, you know, we started off on the DMX and the, what's that other machine? The, the Lin drum. 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 And then the sample drums came in. So what happened was, um, we had to, uh, you know, I wrote a lot of lyrics in the house. I wasn't rhyming and freestyling in everybody's face or nothing, but so I just had to hold my lyrics till I get to a place to record them. So what happened was, you know, Pat says, brother, I knew Mike was the singer. My boy Mike took me up to Mastermind Productions. And then I went up to Mastermind. Mastermind was um, a, a production with Keyboard Money Mike. And they had keyboards up there. Pat used to had a singing group called Two Love. Um, Two Two Love. Love. And then um, it was like R&B, you know, when Silk was out and... Uh, Troop and all of them, they was, they had the, you know, Joe to see, so Pat was a singer. But Pat had equipment, but Pat really didn't get a, a record deal right away. So, you know, Sad was in high school with me, it was a small world. My boy Mike took me up to Mastermind, um, Mastermind Productions, and it was in the projects, you know, Webster Avenue, Nine mm -hmm. Crew, you know, the Nine. So, we went up there, and I ended up going up there, because I went with Mike, was a singer and I was up there and Sad came in the house and I'm like oh wow this your brother you go to and I said oh me and him go to school together we go to Clinton together because I snapped with Sad and them every day at lunchtime you know the basketball team you know I had them on the floor so um, and that's how we met and started from there and then I originally wanted to do a solo album but you know Pat and Miss um um, Moe's mother, um, Miss Smith, put um, everything together and um, everything was there, you know, she, she funded the money for the the surgical pieces, you know, the, we got the SB-12 and stuff like that and then Pat was down with us, Pat had equipment, Pat took a lot of his money, put it into sad studio time, you know, mm. you know Pat had money saved up, Pat had money, Pat put all the money if it wasn't for Pat, we wouldn't have been here, basically. So, Seth's brother did all the funding wow. in the studio time. You know, he said, I'm going to sacrifice my life, put my money on y'all to be big. And he did. He put his money on us and paid for studio time. And I've kind of felt bad because Pat was a humble person and very uh, sincere. You know, he didn't have to put his money up, you know, his savings up. He said, you know what, I'm, I believe in y'all, I'm going to take money and y'all go to the studio. And he spent the money on us in the studio. What, what an absolute legend. Yeah. And, and, then, what, and what was it, you know, um, Keith, what was it that, you know, brought the name Ultramagnetic MCs? How did you I, come I, up with I that made name? the name Ultramagnetic. Uh, I mean, people try to tell me to want you patent the name. I don't have to patent it. I made the name when, when we was writing the lyrics, you know, we was writing high tech lyrics and we was always reading reading space little magazines and stuff. I, I bought a lot of Scientology magazines and stuff. So mm. I said ultra is the highest form, magnetic is to attract. So I put that together and made ultra magnetic. As a name of a group we you know, I, I put that I made that I named that group that high technical name you know it was hard to pronounce with people at first because people wasn't used to the vocabulary of a group being called such a big name and in terms of um you know hip-hop isn't just about mc and hip-hop is a culture yeah so was you having a little dabble at you know like body popping breaking graph i mean how about you uh ti love you into uh, other aspects of uh hip-hop well, in that whole genre, you gotta remember the, the the this this thing has 
this culture has five elements, right? Mm. They claim four, but it's supposed to be five, right? The dancing, the b-boy, breaking, right? Yeah. You got graffiti, right? And the you, DJ. You got the DJ, right? Mm. You also have uh, 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 the b-boy and the b-girl, mm. right? But now you lost one staple. You've lost one particular staple that has always been the connoisseur of it all. For the knowledge? Yeah. The knowledge? Yes. Well, that's, I, I've got the knowledge being a cab driver. That's what they call the knowledge, uh, the, the process of being a cab driver. But you're right. The knowledge is the fifth element because you need to know your history. Exactly. So I used, to, I used to ride on trains. I used to graffiti, mark up the city, try to be all city and things of that nature. Wow. Tack, tack, my boys, tack crew that I went to high school with, you know, mm -hmm. back in the days of junior high into mm -hmm. high school, whatever. And then, you know, it was just a transitioning period. Mm -hmm. And then meeting Keith and Sand in high school, coming out of that, that whole genre. And, and I was working in my, my family's record shop at that particular time. So they would come often, frequently into the store to find out what was new, what was current, or what I can give them ideas on as far as breaks and samples. So mm -hmm. what, tell me about the importance of the uh, working in a record shop. Well, it's just basically you're, you're serving your community. You're a people mm. person. Mm. That's how you get to be able to be a, a, a basically affordable and available to people and your peers. 100%. 100%. That's how you get to meet and, and bond with other so-called air likes. Who, who was passing through the shop? Was there any kind of uh, like DJs and... A whole bunch. I mean, you had all Kid Capri, Doo-Wop, uh, Ron G, yeah. All the staples that was popular at that particular time that was doing their thing. You understand? Wow. And then you had the other ones who didn't want to be known or who were, or, 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 or I should say, up and coming, right? Because mm. Breakbeat Lou and I both worked at the same store. Wow. So we were all in there together doing what we had to do and we would battle like, yo, you got this? No, I ain't got, you ain't got that? Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mixing it up. Yeah. You know, so that was the that was the whole beauty of it. But then it's like, sometimes you might get that call. Bismarck, he might call me like, yo, you got that James Brown record over there? You know? So now once he's questioning or inquiring about a particular record or, or groove, it makes you think twice, like, do I got it, really? So let me check, and I got to make sure I have multiples, because if I don't, and I only got a limited amount of copies, I have to order them again. Mm. So now when I order them, it may take longer to come than the usual time. So if I don't have it, they're going to go somewhere else to buy it, and now I lost out on the sale. Mm. And did you, um, did you kind of get a little bit possessive with the break in terms of like you'd find a sample but you was kind of a little bit secretive mm -hmm. on who you would play that break to because mm -hmm. you'd be like, mm -hmm. I found this break, I don't want other producers to find out about you this until right. I use it. Right, right. Did any of that come into it? Oh yeah, a lot of that, of course. That's right, how it right. starts. Well, people who had covered their records with tape, a lot of tape. Or they'll, yeah. black, or they'll yeah. black out the whole label. Yeah. Oh really? Very Wow. So you couldn't see what they would plan or... Nope. And also, back then, there was no internet. There was no Shazamming and all that, was there? None. So it was literally like, people would want to know what that tune was. Mm. In terms of, um, you know, going back to, like, say, the block parties, was you going to the block parties and part jams? Of course. What, what yeah. was they like? They must have been amazing. They used like, to plug you know, up the stuff to the, um, the lampposts. Wow. The electricity and stuff to get the electricity from the lamppost, McDynasty crew and all the stuff, and everybody used to DJ outside, like mm. in the in the parks with they with the putting the. They didn't even have twelve hundreds. They had um SE belt the SEB one with SLB ones SLB ones and SLB one drives. technique technique turntables, and they put them on top of the box of the technique boxes. I had SLB ones. I never used them. I never took them out the box, and I, I never bought needles. From them. I just you had, had them. collecting dust. I had, two, I, had, I had two of them with the little orange lights on the side. Those are the ones like most yeah, of the. Keith, you still got them boxed up in it? No, nah, they. I, I, threw, I, I think I threw them out or something. Yeah. And then you know they was hard to get. They nah, became, you used it. You used it that day when we came from from the record store. And you bought the twelve inch for Big Daddy King Raw. Um, um, Mike. Um, no, um. Um, Kevin's brother Mike, my boy in Parkchester, had some of those on um, B ones too. They mm -hmm. had those like it was the there was the first beginnings 
turntables before 1200s yeah. turn on. Most of the, all the fast DJs use the, the B1s. So they, they, they Because techniques used to have a little book and you saw all the turns. They used to have another one, whatever, the DCMK. That was yeah, the direct that's, that's drive. The direct Nobody drives. bought that. Like, the 1200s. Because it didn't spin back fast enough. They, was at red, wow. red, they had red lights on them. Then so it had, was it was the B that changed the game. The B one, the B one. Oh, the B one. Yeah, and then they had oh. D ones too, but they was not qualified in in hip hop. I mean, people bought them if you ain't really know that you don't supposed to have those. Those are the mistake turntables people bought, but mostly flashing them had B ones and Theodore, all of them had B ones. Did you ever check them them legends out in the in the park jams? Back yeah, yeah, I've been to. I was going to all the stuff with Jazzy J, you know, mm. all the parties they had in the park, and you know, I went to school with um, Cosmic, Cosmic, and I went to school with, yeah, I went to school with Cosmic, but not so Sonic. I went to school Chubby Chub, Ike, you know, Chubby Chub went to Clinton, you know, and so I went to school with them. So. And was, was you uh, was you guys also getting into that? Because we in the UK we called it electro. So tracks like you know Planet Rock, Perfect Beat, uh, Captain Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all them kind of we called it electro. Was you into when Van Bottom them was um, from Bronx River, and we was from mm. um, Webster and. Was that close to Bronx River? Melrose and all the all the Jackson, all that was like, you know, they had um, Dodge City was DJing, and they had different you know local djs and stuff and you know so it, it was just uh everybody had different territories basically you know we was on the um maybe across maybe down brook avenue side all the south bronx the and Sedna was towards webster avenue and the other people you know bronx river was way up on like toward parkchester so we were, everybody had different sections. Hey, did you get into like b-boying as well? Did, was you a bit of a breaker? Oh, uh, I was a dancer. I was activity before I got popular. I was dancing with New York City Breakers. I went on Dance for the President, you know, Ronald Reagan. We had, went to his, some banquet he had. It was nice and they had bought us, you know, out there. We flew to Washington, me and Pex and I think cra no, Crazy Legs didn't go. It was on um, New York City Breakers, Michael Holman. We flew out to Washington, yeah. D.C. They treated us like so royale. And then we was breaking. And I, well, I was Electric Boogie. Then I, could, I, I danced with Shaq, who I used to dance with Luz Bruce and um, Yogi and um, Al Boogie and, and, and Supreme. So I was the only guy in the Bronx that danced with a Harlem, you know, hus a Harlem hustler group, you know. Which was they sold dust on 119 Street. So we was, I was, you know, I was dancing, I was dancing not even with guys that was supposed to dance. They was just hustlers that dance. So we always, you know, well, what's the name of them all? Was full blooded dancers like um, um, Fable and them and Rock Mr. Steady. Wiggles and all of them. Mr. Wave, all of them was more like real dedicated dancers. We was more like dancing's just hanging out dancers but we was we ran the city dancing basically we was the top dancers we go to the roxy and we get dressed and go to roxy on friday night as soon as we come in the club everybody that danced in the club we used to stop and be like oh y'all here oh, here's the floor and i used to be like no nah, you know y'all go ahead and dance you know we're not here to scare you not to dance <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it was. I'm not here to we battle. Got, we, you know, they just thought like they like because they knew, you know. And then we we break up and form Voltron because I danced in the Bronx as activity. I sometimes switch up and dance with um, what was his name? Um, who was his name? He used to dance in Flex Flexologist mm -hmm. in Edenmore. Mm -hmm. I danced with Flex. Some uh, <coughs> Suprema danced by herself. Loose Bruce would dance by himself and Al and Yogi would dance in separate places. So we all danced separate around the city, but then we go to the Roxy and form Voltron. So that was the power. Only people that gave us problems was a little bit maybe like Lockatron John and them was from Brooklyn. You know, they had they uniform they come in uniform with all they 
captain, you know, they wore pirate and all kinds of, you know, they was nice. So that was a, like mostly our competition, basically, when we saw like Lockatron, John and them. But we was dancing all over the city, but most of the electric boogie contests was won by Loose Bruce and Supreme, and um, that was it. And you had Spud and, you know, you had, a, you know, Slick Watts was dancing. You know, everybody had different parts of the city, but we was always kind of like the best. Mm -hmm. On Friday and Saturday, we formed Voltron and go down to the Roxy, and everybody that appeared to dance was scared to get on the dance floor. So let me ask you, when that happened after the fact, when you always killed the city, because I'm helping him right now, Okay. Mm -hmm. how did you wind up dancing for the president? Because I was popular. I was popular. <laughs> it's so easy to answer. Because then a lot of people don't know you're in that movie. I was popular. You're in that movie um, with Robin Williams. Yeah, well, I was, I was a, they, I was hot not from a movie. I was hot dancing in the streets. No, the I know that, and that's how you got to the movie. Dancing in every place, and all the rappers that had records knew me anyway. People that damn had records out and stuff knew me from dancing. You know, Shaq who was known for dancing. Everybody was dancing around the city. We was known for dancing. We danced like kind of like uh, Panama, like Shiz and Yanel. We danced very pop. We was more like pop. You know, we didn't do the a lot of the wiggling and stuff. We didn't do a lot of the touch me and I touch you in the way. We didn't do that. We mm -hmm. did more pop, you know. No, so, you know, you had different people. Larry Love just used to float on his legs and his Shake feet. it all and, over the place. Like, you know, you know, wow. his feet look like they don't touch the ground. There was right. only two guys like that. It was my boy Mike used to float, and then you know, you had a different people. You had Ace and D Ski. They used to do the cigarette trick with their mouth, and you know, you had different characters. You know, all over it's the Spud. You know, you had all kinds of different dances around the city, but we were more known because we was more. You know, we had the swag of. <clears throat> and you look, you looked the part as well. What kind of garments was you rocking? I mean, was you busting? I was out wearing like the fur kangos, like not that, not the one, you know, not the Spitfire, and not the, not the, um, not the Bermuda. What's the? I had, I had the one that was like a, the one that yeah, the one that looked like a bell. Oh, uh, the hard, the hard top. The, the hard bell, top the bell fur one, the one that you oh, the put. The one, the, the one you put the bell on, the nice bell, and the the bell one you put the baby all around. That one, the fur one, mm. you know, which which are they? Those are still hot, you know. I got a I got a bunch of those too. The Lancy Street shark skins, you know, right, right. stuff that, like that. that. Bought, Shiny bought? pants look like you can see your face, <laughs> you know, look a look like like a fish scale pants, <laughs> like they look like a like real metallic, you know, like the ones I got on. But these are. He's a, um, my boy Gallery Department, you know, like, he's like $1,500. Where was that, where, you know, where were you getting the club? $1,500, mate. Where was you getting uh, the club from? Was there like certain shops that you'd buy all that, all that, like, wicked? Well, I bought it in Delancey, that's where Delancey, everybody used the main to go joint. get the cardigan right. sweaters, the, 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 the overlaps, and, the, uh, you know, you had your cardigans, your quarterfields. And um, sheepskins, you know, had the sheepskin coats, you know, like, you know, like you see these new people like Daniel's Leather and stuff. Um, they were pretty late. I mean, sheepskins were sold way back, way before time, you know, and people having, you know, it was only a gray one and, and, a, and a brown one. Like, you know, recently people just made colors out of them, you know, they start making them into burgundy and, and, and purple and all that. But before they was, um... Was it brown and gray? They was just brown and gray. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the black people had the brown. See, black people, we had the furs and the minks too. And black and the brown sheepskins. And then maybe like, um, like the Latin people, they wore more like the, the gray one. The gray, the Latin culture wore the gray one. Until the beige came And then out. the beige one, the, you know, we was went to the beige one and the minks and the, and the one that 
was like a a, a super maxi coat to the floor. <clears throat> so all you know that style that people are wearing now, they had that back in the eighties. And the Kazal glasses were in different colors. Like Kazals were lime green. Kazals was you know a, red, a you plexiglass, see through mm. kind of like fiberglass, like 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 you know like the back of a backboard, see through or like light blue. Um, sky blue, silver. That's what it was. Yeah, because the Cazelles, they they were proper b-boy glasses, isn't it? I mean, the quality of them Cazelles. I think they were made in West Germany, but the quality were like. Well, they still quality. sell Cazelles. Yeah, I've got, I've, got, remember, I've got a pair. Yeah, You've got yeah, a pair. yeah. Everybody got Cazelles. I still yeah. want to. I gotta get some new ones. So Cazelles was like, you know, but back the colors now kind of conserved now. You know, people mm. just make the black ones. You might find lucky if you get a. Uh, uh, maybe a brown pair now, but back back then they had like sky blue, yellow, and <laughs> orange, know. and 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 you know they had another counteract partner. You know Sergio Valente right. was the other glasses, but they was trying to do it. Sergio, that's when the girls was wearing Jordash. Remember yeah, Jordash to cover your ass. Mm -hmm. Devil Jordash and um, <laughs> Sassoon. Sassoon, right, Sassoon and know, the glory of Vanderbilt. You know, yeah. you know, Sassoon Jordash was always on that ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to mm. say as well, like, um, who was kind of influencing you as, I mean, because you're incredible MC. Me? So I never had any influence. You just kind of like... I pick, was pick. my own influence, mate. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I bought just... a lot of records when I was younger. I was collecting... Um, I collected uh, only funk records. Mm. I I bought like Slave was my favorite band, Slide, and um, I bought a lot of Inst Undisputed Truth and Confunction and maybe like uh, Fatback. Not Fatback. I bought Instant Funk and I bought uh, Cameo. Cameo was okay. I bought Heat Wave. I bought uh, you know all kinds of hoops that wore crazy costumes oh, yeah. but I like Sun, Grass Construction, the KGs, the Barkays mm -hmm. that oh. inspired my music to be funky. I never collected jazz at all. I was never into jazz. So I was a funky man all of my life. Yeah, so I had, I, had, I had soul in my <laughs> I had soul in my body and when I worked with Roger Troutman it was a great experience and wow. my life was different I just never grew up on jazz Mark, you was coming out of Chicago, wasn't it? Yeah So yeah. How, how was that Chicago scene? Well, the Chicago scene was like disco early disco but we was playing stuff like Din Dada and White Horse and mm. Man Parish you know, oh, the leader Holloway. On the ride, on the white pony, that. Yeah, yeah. Then you hear shit, stuff like Love Sensation and all those type of records. Love too. Sensation. Yeah. Percolator and all that? Yeah. No, that was Time later to get on. the percolator and that all came, that. That came later, though. Oh, yeah. You know, Chicago sound. Well, New matched. York had that too with well, we Colonel matched. Abrams and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we matched the, 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 the um, what was y'all club out Follow there? Me, that's what y'all was playing. Garage. They Follow the garage, Me. Yeah, the garage and the music doom, box. Doom. They married I mean. each other for a long time. but mm. So Chicago was late on rap. But we got rap, I think, and, you know, we had um, Casper, the, the Groovy Ghost. He was the first, he put the first rap record out, which was a disco rap record. You can find that record. That's a funky record, you know, but we was late on it. So we was kind of getting influences from the East Coast and the West Coast. So we was trying to figure out our sound. I just collected a lot of funk. The person I worked with jazz was like Godfather Don did more like a, a, dark. a mean kind of jazz. Yeah, like more like dark. Like coming down the street late at night, jazz with you know rugged jazz, but I never was into some of those those sweet jazz records. They were too always kind of they were too just too more musical for me for like Broadway plays and stuff. I didn't get into jazz like you was a, you was more of a funk star. Funk person, if I did jazz, it had to be like some hardcore jazz, like you know, like when you listen to Papa Large that. Mm. horn that blow on it you know certain kind of jazz see the man on the street who's at the corner hard. type of stuff i didn't get on any kind of jazz we was funky i played bass lines on most of my tracks guitars and stuff i played the keyboards on 90 percent of that the records that we put out you know from every album from tim stuff to ultra stuff to my stuff i played the bass lines on 
a lot of the records. Wow. I made sure the group stayed funky, you know. And talking of funk, I mean, for me, like, when I bought Funky on Next Plateau uh, back in the day, you know, it blew me away. But then when I turned it over on the B side, I was hearing uh, Mentally Mad. And when I heard Mentally Mad, I thought I was blown away with Funky, but that even blew me away even more. Well, I was Mentally like, Mad was an accident record. I didn't really like. I really, honestly, never liked it. Mentally Mad. <laughs> People like it, but you know, it was just it was too too radical. It was just we was just going with when the Noise records was out. Remember was when everybody had to make the noise and mm. everybody had to make noisy records. I, I, it was cool, but I didn't like it per se. But people liked it. It was it was just a good accident. It was a cool accident. But I I, I always hated mentally, mentally mad. You know, I like other records that we made. You know, even like the Funky Head of album is the, uh, like a slept on album. I like that album more than really a lot of our albums. I mean, Critical Beatdown was a good album, but I like you know. Even Four Horsemen, I like Time to Catch a Body, different things, you know, I played the bass on that, mm. you know, Porno Star, stuff like that, and Secret Fantasies on Tim album. Dude, who was in the Four Horsemen? Uh, me, Trevor, Sad, and Mo was the Four Horsemen. Mm. So. I mean, what, what, what a name as well, the Four Horsemen, the four I mean, horsemen. it sounds great. Well, yeah. we took the name from the, the version of the Apocalypse. Mm. Well, the wrestling group. Yeah, the wrestling group. Oh. So, um, Four Horsemen was the album. We did that one, finished it. And, you know, Don was on there with production. And um, it was pretty cool. Like, those records were cool, good, you know. You know, any, all the albums to me was good, you know. Then leading into my solo career, the, <laughs> those records were cool. Cover, the cover of Critical uh, Beatdown, you you guys look absolutely incredible. When I interviewed Said G, we spoke about it. Uh, big shout out to Said as well, man. Um, but listen, you you looked amazing on that cover. Where, where was you getting, you well, know... The... Well, I got to thank Jimmy Jenkins and, and, and um, um, Uptown, and, you know, you know, we got to thank Andre because uh, really the group didn't want to dress. Basically, uh, Andre said, you guys got to go get some, do something, get some different costumes. They took us, George took us up to Dapper Dan mm. and um, Dapper Dan sized us up with measurements and made clothes. I was always dressing, but I'm saying as the group, they needed some kind of formation to start dressing. And, you know, and thanks to Uptown's development, artist development. You know, that's what happened. We ended up with a nice cover. Oh, it's a brilliant cover. And uh, TR Love, have you got? You, is that the original jacket you're wearing on stage on the tour? Because that you look wicked. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's same. That's an original. That's the same wow. jacket, brother. Wow. The same nostalgic album cover jacket, 35, 40 years later. Wow, you have preserved that. That is in mint condition. Yes. I don't know. What is it, like in an right. airtight container or something? <laughs> yeah? well, they had it in the Hip Hop Museum actually on display for a minute. Right. It was in the Hip Hop Museum. Wow. Which is going to be that, um, the, uh, the Urban Underground National Museum all the way, all the way through. That's going to be opening up in, in, in New York City in the Bronx right. in 25, and then they're going to have it in DC as well. Well, listen, I know we're a little bit pushed for time and, you know, we need to get to places and we need to rest up on the, vo the vocal cords and all that stuff. Right. But uh, quickly tell me about the tour. It's a wicked tour. And, um, you know, where, where are you touring at the moment? Well, right now we're here in London doing day three at the Forge. The Big Smoke. Right. And then from that, we got to get ready to go on to the other side of the world. Mm. We're going to go with Belgium, Denmark, you know. Things of that nature, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Switzerland. So we're just still here. We're moving around. We're, we're, well, we're taking the courses as they come. They're getting they're getting conditioned to be on tour. I'm always on tour. When I'm back home, I'm always on the road. And this their time of coming out to get their getting the kinks cardiovascular. Up. I've been touring every year, after year, after year, making new records. And you know, Black Elvis two and featuring magnetic projects and doing all kinds of stuff. Well, it's, it's legendary, you know, for you guys to make the trip over to London and to Europe. And um, is there like, a, um, you know, a, a big shout out you want to give to all your fans? Oh, I like to give, uh, you know, everybody who buys our records across the country and around the world a big shout out and 
people who support the organization and how about you mark you want to give a shout out yeah everybody that you know supports the um you know ultra magnetic you know. this guy's a rich guy he's he's with miss he's with um black pegasus black right? pegasus that's he right. owns a label any of these yeah. independent guys who own labels they, well, i'm dropping you off money. now like, to uh you know, to cut mr bongo they yeah, cut master curtain these guys they they collect money they get a lot of money for vinyl yeah they got a lot of Big bank accounts. No, no, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> all these guys with vinyl companies, you know. It's a lot of um, online labels. These guys make a lot of money from. Well, I'm just about to drop Mark off at Mr. Bongo, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. we're gonna have a meeting. Mark going to Mr. Bongo to close another deal. So uh, listen, we could go into a lot more detail, and I wish we had a lot more time. Um, but I know we're pushed for time. I want to get you back as well, Trev, to rest I'm up. I'm a hustler. Well. I'm a hustler. I'm a hustler. I'm a hustler. Uh, but know, every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. <laughs> every day I'm hustling. It's the year of the ultras, babies. Well, listen, what can I say? It's an absolute honor having you all in the cab. I just want to say that it was nice having a conversation with you. But next time, maybe we'll talk with some tea. <laughs> Tea and biscuits. <laughs> Tea and, 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 Brilliant. And, and biscuits. Brilliant. Now nah, listen, it's an honor having you all in the cab. Let's let, let's get let's get <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Mo Love and Said Jeep. Yeah, shout I was to gonna say Zed, you wanna shout give to a, the brothers. You wanna give us big shout out to the to the uh, to Said and the uh, the other guys. Yes. Yeah. Mo Love and Said. Mo Love, big shout out to Said and Mo Love. We love Europe. Europe is the best. And also I'd like to give um DJ Too Tough from the uh, Tough Crew shout out. I mean, he's done incredible as well, wasn't it? Yeah, on, yeah. on the decks. Too Tough is yeah. in the building. He's yeah. working. He's too working. Tough is always, you know, Philadelphia's finest, Jersey, Camden, you know, whatever. DJ Too Tough to the Tough Crew. Definitely. He's tougher than tough and he's tough been rocking them decks. I've seen him live on them turntables and he owns those decks. He's done absolutely incredible. He's right. He's making sure everything is working smoothly. Yeah. Okay. Legend. Shout out to Two Tough. When you come back to London, yeah, we'll, we'll have more time and I'll take you on a proper tour. Oh no, you don't have to take me on a tour. I've been on, I know the city. I've been around. Yeah, I, but listen, I, 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 I go all city. around. I go all around. I, I, yeah, I'm but a, Keith, listen, I'm a London cabbie, right? There's a no in the city and there's no in the city. Right. I there's know the difference. city. I know the so, city. Yeah, but listen, I know. I it. know it more than you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my knowledge. <laughs>